come back to communion, back to the storm. Run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you. Can't talk the weight has been lifted, graces waiting. With the spirit of the morning, there is freedom, there is freedom. With the spirit of the morning, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out in the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of this For the spirit is here. And shake at the sound of Jesus' name. And lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. The chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. And lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name.
You know, I'm singing that last song, and that is a, um, it's an old, I think it's from, from the 90s, isn't it? It's the, it's, it's a re, but it's an old remake of a hymn that's hundreds of years old. And so I sang it as a child in hymn form, and now um, we're singing, now it's a, the old, the remake of the old hymn is old, so I don't know what that makes me, like really old, but anyway, uh, man, it's still powerful. A lot of those old hymns just have some very powerful um, words and, and, and doctrine in them, and, and man, I just enjoy um, singing those, and I know Brandon does a great job leading our worship team. Thank you, Brandon. Y'all did a great job today. Good. Give it up for them. Now that y'all are in a good mood, I'm fitting to get all up in your business. Y'all ready? This is a all up in your business kind of sermon, so anyway, I know some of y'all are like, well, do you have any other kind? Probably not. But what we're talking today is what it means to be apart and apart. And, you know, we're called to be a part of the world that we live in, but we're also called to be apart from it. And so there are the, the notes there. If you want to click on that, it'll open up the sermon notes for you, and uh, you can follow along in the verses and uh, see those. But we're going to begin where Jesus uh, addresses this. And, and just so, you know, he, he had talked about it numerous times about um, you know, we live in a world where there are two kingdoms that overlap, and the, the dominion of darkness rules in this world, and yet they're not able to overrule God. God's reign is, is uh, uh, also uh, where we can see it. We've seen it through Jesus, and we're called to live in it, but we also live in a place that is dominated by um, the powers of darkness, and we can see that in our culture around us in the, the lives of people and the things that are, that are going on around us. And so there's a lot of tension that comes in living in this place because it's God's creation, but it's been um, subjugated by sin. It was our sin that, that wrecked God's creation. And the evil one has freedom to move and as however he chooses here on this earth. And so we live in this tension between being in this world or a part of it, but also having been called to be a part from the system of governance that is here. You know, the Bible talks about there are uh, principalities and powers of darkness. And so Jesus talks about this in John chapter 17. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles there, we're going to take up the reading in uh, verse 14. And one of the things that I, I love about this passage is, it's one of the few, maybe the only places where not only is Jesus praying for the disciples that are there in the moment, but he's also praying with us in mind, and he prays for us in this passage of Scripture. And so uh, um, it's a very meaningful passage because of that to me. But if you'd please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, uh, John 17, beginning in verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. Thank you, and you may be seated. You know, and Jesus talks about a couple things that we're going to talk about today, and that's that we're sent into this world by him. We have a purpose while we're here. We're called to be a part of this world, and part of that purpose is found in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. When we live in this world, we're supposed to live differently. And it should be obvious to the people that we live amongst. 
And we live in a world, in a culture where if you're truly living for Christ, it is going to, to stand out more than probably at any other time in history. One of the things that I've thought a lot about is, there, and I thought about it in two 40-year increments, um, 1940, what the world was like then. Now, I wasn't born then, so you know, don't get all excited. But till 1980, there was a, a sizable difference in the things that were acceptable and in the way the world operated and what the world thought was okay and wasn't. And that's one 40-year break. Now, if you look from that to now, from 1980 till 2022, that's, we've had a much bigger jump, a much bigger drop in morality, a much bigger drop in adherence to God's Word and respect for the things of God. As a matter of fact, in 1940 and 1980, the, the, one of the things that would have remained constant was that most people, the vast majority of people, would have told you they believed in God. And they would have told you that God's Word was true. And now in the last 40 years, that number has diminished rapidly, even inside the church sometimes, about how many believe there is a God and how many believe that His Word is true. That, that number has changed drastically in the last 40 years. And one of the things that I want you to think about is, as big of a drop as there's been in the last 40 years, from 1980 until now, what do you think that's going to look like 40 years from now in our current tra trajectory, in the path that we're going? In the 40 years from, that are in our future, we're going to be fighting against things, just like I, our, a lot of people who were here in 1980, we're fighting things that we never thought we would fight. And in 40 years, and in those 40 years that are ahead of us, we're going to have to fight things that we never thought we would fight. One of the things that I'm going to tell you right now that we're going to have to, to fight as believers and as people in this country is we're going to have to fight what is going to be a concerted normalization of uh, pedophilia. That's, that's coming. It's already begun, and it's going to come even more. And you're going to get to a point where you're thinking, I cannot believe we're arguing about this. Just like we're arguing right now about what is a woman and about what gender is and all that. I never would have thought 40 years ago that that would be something that we would be arguing about, and yet here we are. I never would have thought that we would have a nominee for the Supreme Court of the United States of America who could stand up and in direct testimony refuse to give a definition for what is a woman. I never would have thought we would be there. And you, you, you keep thinking, well, this is as far as it's going to go, but I'm telling you, we have not even in our minds conceived of the, the kind of evil that the enemy has in store for us. And yet this is a world that we're called to be a part of. We're called to live in such a way that our good deeds shine before men so that they may give glory to our Father who's in heaven. If you live as a believer... You're going, to have, you're going to experience this at some point. Somebody's going to come up to you and say, hey, you're different. Why are you different? They're going to want to know what it is. And at that point, the Bible tells us we need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in us. And that hope is Jesus. And so you're going to have an opportunity. If you're living for Christ at all, that's going to stand out. If you're living a life that's trying to follow the Lord and follow the things of God, that's going to stand out more than ever in the times coming up as they did in the times than they did in times past. And that's part of our mission. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I'm with you always even to the end of the age. That's called the Great Commission. And that's what our church operates under and what we operate under. We believe it is our job as a church to give the good news of Jesus Christ to the people that we come in contact with, to find ways to reach out in our community, and we do that. We do that on a local level. There are ways that, that we, uh, we support ministries that are here in our town that reach out to people, um, whether it's the... Uh, um, the Center of Hope, where we help and provide food and services to people in our community. We do that as a means of, to reach people for Christ. 
we do that through our outreaches. We go out and we give, sometimes we give out water on hot days or we give out um, suckers in, in, at the Peach Fest. We do all kinds of things like that. And one of the reasons we do that and one of the things that we've seen from that is, is you, you, I can't tell you how many times we've had someone come to church here and something's happened in their life and they need some spiritual hope and they're looking for spiritual guidance and they chose to come here because whether it was three years or a year or three months ago or three days ago, somebody came up and told them we wanted to show you the love of God in a practical way and we gave them a water or something else at a time when they needed it and later on when they needed spiritual guidance, they came here. You want to know why they came here? Because we've already shown them part of our testimony by serving them in some random way. It seemed to them random. It was not to us random. It's intentional. But we've served them in some way in the past. I can't tell you how many people have come here because of one of those acts of kindness that you're a part of. But not only do we do that in our community, we support other churches. We're supporting right now a church plant in San Antonio. We've already taken a a mission trip down there to help them. We support a church plant in Colorado, and we've got um, uh, Austin. Is Austin, I think, is up there right now, or he's going to be up there soon. And we send mission trips up there. We're going to send mission trips up to help them start. And if you've been kept your eye on Colorado, they need church plants in places that will preach the Word of God. So we're going to go do that. Not only have we done that, but we have been a part of starting churches in Haiti, of supporting pastors who are in Haiti, of supporting a, an orphanage there uh, of where kids can come and be taught the things of God and be taught um, regular school things. We've gone and been a part of those. Now, we're not able at this point, we haven't in a few years because of the rise in violence and anarchy that's ruled in Haiti. We haven't been, a, been able to be a part of that. But we're going to be a part of going, to, going overseas again, and we're looking for opportunities to do that. Not only that, but we contribute through our convention to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And 100% of that, we contribute a percentage of everything we have that comes into this church goes to missions, local missions and foreign missions. As a matter of fact, we've, we've, been, we've gotten certificates or whatever, you know, we don't display them anywhere, for being one of, if not the top giver in our county to foreign missions. And we send missionaries all over the world. And that's something that we are called to do, we're a part of, and we're going to continue to do. So we're part of that commission. And you're a part of that commission too. You know, most of the people that come here in the last service, there were three people that indicated they had accepted Christ as their Savior and Lord during our service. And that didn't happen by accident. That happens because you tell people about our church and you invite them to come and be here. And then we have people that, that we baptize because one of you led them to Christ. And man, we love those stories and we want to be a part of them. But one of the things you can always know is you can always at any time bring somebody to one of our worship services and they're going to hear the gospel. Now, in a, coming up in a few weeks on August 21st, Ronnie Hill, he's our staff evangelist. He travels all over the, the country and all over the world preaching the, the, the gospel is going to be here on the 21st, and he's going to give an evangelistic message. So we want to encourage you right now, be thinking about people in your life that you know don't know Jesus or are not going to church, and invite them here on the 21st or any Sunday. But that Sunday in particular, we're going to be giving a, a, an evangelistic message. And so we want to encourage you to be a part of that. That's part of our mission. You know, there are a lot of different kinds of churches, and churches are getting caught up in this fight between being a part of the world and being a part from the world. And you'll see some churches that will compromise their message. And in their mind, I think they're trying to reach more people. But when you compromise your message, you have nothing to give them. And then you see churches that are being separatists. And that they're uh, pulling away from the world. And we're not doing that either as a church. We want to be in that. It's, it's an uncomfortable place a lot of times. But we want to be in that place where we're reaching out to the world and being a part of that mission. So we want you to be doing that as individuals as well. So we've designed our church around that. One of the things that we do is we keep things simple. 
We don't have something up here for you every night of the week because we want you to be able to develop relationships with people that don't know Christ. We want you to be in the community. And so we don't do everything that we could do. We try to keep it simple. We do small groups. We do worship service. We do a couple other things, but we don't try to keep a full schedule because we want you to have time to be in your community. <clears throat> the second thing that we do that's different is there are a lot of churches that are like cruise ship churches. In other words, everybody comes, the staff does all the work, tries to make everybody happy. That's not us. We are a battleship church. When you come here and you're a part of the mission, then you have a job. And you have responsibility, and that's talking to lost people. That's bringing them here to church. There may be, there are areas in the church that you can serve in, whether it's coming to an outreach, whether it's, you know, helping with the kids, whatever it may be. We want everybody that comes here to have a job and a part of the mission. And so that's the kind of church that we are. As you know, I'm up front about things. I want you to know that up front. Now, here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9. Even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. <clears throat> when I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I may bring them to Christ. But there's, here's where the rub comes. Even though he's living in a way that he can reach them, he says, but I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I'm with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. So we are a church where you can come, you can find fellowship, you can find people that you can live life with. We have a lot of small groups, there are different um, friendships within our church, there are different relationships, and we're open to more people. We want you to come and find your place. Try a small group, if that doesn't work, try another one. There are people here that are trying to live to follow Christ. Now we're not perfect, and if you're perfect, don't come here. We'll just mess you up. If you're perfect, this ain't the place for you, all right? Now, if you're not perfect, you're welcome here because we're not either. Ain't nobody here perfect, me included. My family can testify to that. My friends can testify to it. And a couple of um, French bulldogs, if they could talk, would squeal on me like nobody's business. I know that. I ain't perfect, all right? That's why I'm thankful animals can't talk. But anyway, we're not perfect. And we would love for you to come and find a place and find a, a group of people that you can help live life with. And we love each other. That's one of the, the hallmarks of our church is we love each other. We disagree sometimes, but we love each other. And here's the thing, though. We're not going to love each other to the point where we're exclusive to everybody else. We ain't doing that. Okay? Because there's a lot of other people out there that need to know the love of Jesus and need to know the good news about Jesus dying on the cross so that we could be saved. And so that's why we want you to find people like, that, are, that are like that here. We want you to find people that will help you and encourage you in your, in your walk to follow Christ. But we also want you to be developing relationships and live those outside the church as well. Paul did it. He found common ground with everyone because we want to, we want to see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Now, here's the hard part of that. And that's being a part of the world while also being apart from the world. And that's where it gets tricky, and that's where it gets difficult. Because, you know, you, you, it's not our job to go out and tell every lost person everything wrong they're doing. Our job is to develop relationships with them so that we might be able to share the gospel with them at some point. But we have to be careful. <clears throat> because we cannot allow... Jesus hung out with tax gatherers, he hung out with thieves, and he hung out with prostitutes, okay? He, he was around them, but he didn't participate in the activities they were participating in that were contrary to the word and the law of God. And that's where it gets hard. 
You know, I had a guy tell me one time, well, you know, man, this guy, he wouldn't listen to me until I went into a bar and I drank a beer with him, and now, you know, now he'll listen to me. I'm like, so why did you tell him you wouldn't go before him? Because I was a believer, and I told him that I didn't go into bars, and I didn't, I didn't drink, and I didn't participate in those things. And I said, well, all you've done is that now you've, he succeeded in showing that, that what you said was your testimony wasn't real. And so what are you going to tell him now? And that's where we have to be careful. I'm not getting into the drinking thing. There are people who have different opinions of it. But that's what he had told him before, and that's what changed. And here's the thing. You're not going to be able to share the good news of Christ with people if you compromise your testimony in the hopes of doing it. And so we have to live apart from the world. And that's where it does get tricky. And here's a couple things I want to share with you. Number one, there are a lot of great, I mean, there are a lot of beautiful things in the world. And and God gave them to us to enjoy. But we need to be careful about loving the things of this world. It says in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. See, that's the thing we're supposed to love people who are in the world, but not love the world. Here's the deal. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And that's all the world has to offer is a craving. And it's a craving that can never be satisfied through what the world offers. Have you noticed, you know, like when, when there are commercials for this or that or there's something the media is putting forward, it's always like a perfect world. And everybody's like, man, that's cool. I mean, they don't show a bunch of people, beer companies don't show a bunch of people laying around, passed out in their own vomit, do they? You know what they show? are the beautiful people that seem like, man, they're, they're having the perfect life. They're out on the beach enjoying the sunset. They're having all this fellowship together. They don't show you what's coming after. All they're doing is giving you a craving for something that that can't fulfill. You know, man, if you, if you buy this brand of beer, all the beautiful girls will want to go out with you. I mean, it's, a, it's a, an illusion, and it is deceit. And we need to be careful about buying into that. It's a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the, from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. You know, we spend too much time seeking after the things of the world, seeking approval, seeking to fit in, seeking to be a part, seeking to get our, our, our bit of money, what we want, what we need. That's what we do. And here's the thing. You know, I, I learned a long time ago, there's sometimes a disconnect between who we say we are and who we really are. What we do and the choices that we make that defines who we are. But there's a disconnect, and it's getting even bigger because the generation before them has lived it out in front of them, and now there's a huge disconnect in this younger generation. They, think all, they say all the time, well, yeah, I did that, and I do that, and I do that, but that's not really who I am. And now it's gotten to the point where, well, yeah, I know that biologically... I'm a male, but that's not really who I am. And now everybody else has to just agree with it. You see, those things are connected. But the bottom line is that who God created us to be and the choices that we make in life, those things define who we are, not our feelings. But we've gotten to this place now, and, and, and I'm not trying to get on to the transgender issue or whatever, what I'm telling you is there's a part of that that is in the church. 
And there's a whole big part of that that is in the generation that we're trying to raise now to lead the church and to lead our, our country down the road. And there's this idea, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I do that, but that's not really who I am. And that's a lie. You know, it says in Proverbs that even a young man is known by what he does, by his actions. That's how we're known. It's not by our feelings. Oh, well, that person feels that way about themselves. Yeah, but you know what we're known? It's by our actions. You know, somebody who's at a, at a place of work and they think they're smart enough to run the place and they think they're a valuable employee because that's the way they feel, but they don't work hard. They don't show up sometimes. That's not how they're seen. They're viewed by their actions. Oh, well, I'm a nice person, but you're not nice to people. You say things on the interwebs that are mean and spiteful and hateful. You don't help people when you have a chance. You don't encourage people. You put them down. Well, but that's not who I am. Yeah, it is. It is who you am. Stop being who you am. And be something different. We got to get away from this disconnect that what we do is different from what we are. Your testimony is lived first and then spoken. And nobody cares what you're speaking if they can't see it first. Well, you know, I'm a Christian, but yeah, I like to cuss and I like to do this. Man, people are not going to come ask you for your testimony when you're not living one. You got to live it first. I told y'all I was going to get up on your business. You see, here's the deal. We've become like the world in way too many areas. I see even Christian girls that are using the hint of sex to try to attract guys. And clothing that we have determined is totally acceptable now that was would not have been allowed in public just a generation or two before us. Did you know that when they invented the bikini, I know, y'all wait, wait for it. <laughs> Get ready. They decided to debut it at the French fashion shows and none of the models would wear it in public. None of them. So you know what they had to do? to model the first bikinis at fashion shows, they had to hire strippers. They were the only ones who would wear that in public at a fashion show. Now, we're a long way from that. But you know what? Here's something I'm going to tell any girl in here. If you're using sex to attract a guy, expect it to attract a guy that only wants you for sex. Bottom line. And guys, I'm going to tell you, if you're seeing girls as something that are there for your amusement or to use, I want you to understand they are co-heirs with Christ. They are created in the image of God, and you are in your mind and in your heart and your actions defiling the image of God when you treat them as anything less. I done got everybody in here now, ain't I? At some point. I know, you know what, and I know. I know, oh, well, he's just being old-fashioned. I don't care what you want to call it. You know what, the Bible says men are to treat women with honor and respect. And the Bible says women are supposed to live in such a way and dress in such a way that they invite that kind of behavior. Now, I'm not saying either one of them is at fault more than the other. They're both at fault. And we need to have that in mind when we dress and when we interact with people. There it is. <laughs> Romans 12, 1 through 2. But I won't be popular. I won't be this or that. 
good. Let me tell you something. You know what's coming? It's already here. If you're going to be a believer, you're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be ostracized in some circles. People are going to talk about you. And we need to stop raising kids that think that getting along with everybody and being part of the crowd and fitting in is the way to go. We need to start raising kids that understand what it means to live different and to be different because that's how they're going to have to live if they're going to live for Christ. Now, they're going to have to make their own choice about whether they're going to do it or not, but we better start raising kids that understand what it means to live differently. And adults, we better start modeling it. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. What are you doing with your body? It's supposed to be a living sacrifice before God. This is truly the way to worship Him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Young Single women, do carry yourself in such a way and expect nothing less than finding a young man or a man of whatever age, whatever, how old you are, that loves Jesus and will treat you as a co-heir in Christ, as someone who is made and created in the image of God. Young men, look for a woman that loves Jesus and that serves Him first and you second. That loves Him first and you second. Women, the same thing for you. I want you to look around at some of the relationships of people that are that are living life and going about things the same way you are? Are those relationships that you really want? Find, quit looking around at people that, oh my gosh, they're Facebook official and it's so beautiful and so cute, I want that. Quit looking around at people that have been together for four months. Find people that have, that have found somebody and have been married for decades and see what makes them tick. See how they've done it. And look for that. I'm just, here's, as honest as I can possibly be, at some points, it don't matter how cute they look in their jeans. It's going to change at some point. Stuff changes. You don't get a choice about that. Find somebody that's got something more important than that. That won't change. Then the last thing is this. Mark 8, 38, 34 through 38. Then call in the crowd to join his disciples. He said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross. Follow me. And you know what? I understand that I'm the same way. That when I hear that phrase, I don't necessarily have the same thought. It doesn't come into my mind like a lightning bolt like it would have to them. Because you know what? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. But we've got crosses on our walls. We've got them as stickers on our vehicles. We wear them sometimes as jewelry on our body. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that reminder of the cross. But part of the result of that is, is it doesn't hit us the way it did the people that were following at that moment. Because in their day and age, a cross had one purpose. And that was death. That was all that it meant. And when Jesus said, if any of you wants to be my follower, 
You must give up your own way. Take up your cross. You want to know why I said that? Because it was customary for those who were condemned and who were going to die to pick up their cross and take it to where they were going to be crucified, which Jesus did. And so take up your cross was an invitation to come and die. If you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? You know, here's part of the thing. Jesus told us he was coming back. You know what he also, what he told you? You ain't going to have no warning. And you know what? I, I, everybody, we'd all love it if Jesus would come back on a Sunday, wouldn't we? I'm in church. I'm fine with Jesus coming back and getting me right now. I'm good with that. But let me ask you a question. Would you have been okay with Jesus coming back to get you with what you were doing last night? Or yesterday? Or last week? Do you really want him showing up with what you've been doing lately? Because Jesus said, you ain't going to have no idea. You're going to be going about life in a normal way, and I'm going to show up. And then the last part of this verse, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message... In these sin, adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That's one of the hardest things that Jesus ever said. And you know what? That doesn't mean that, that if, if, if you're not doing something you should be when Jesus comes back, or you're doing something you shouldn't be, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love you anymore, and it doesn't mean that your sins aren't forgiven. But I, I, I'm telling you, I don't always get this right, and I'm sure I got my moments, but when Jesus comes back, I want him to be pleased with me in that moment. And some of us are living lives in such a way that we wouldn't want Jesus to come back some of the time. And that's not a good way to be living. If anyone is, and that, and that goes back to where, how we're living. Are you really living a testimony? Or are you living in such a way that would make people think you're ashamed to be known by the name of Christ? It is a, it's a tough thing. This whole being a part of the world, but being apart from the world. It, it's, it's a constant struggle. But that's, that's the life that we have. And you know what? There's, there's all of us, I'm certain, and me included, where there aren't areas where I could do better at that. And I bet that's true for you too. But here's what I want to encourage you. You know, we spend a lot of time as Christians trying to see how close we can get to the line without crossing over it. And then, unfortunately, we cross over it, too. How about seeing how far we can stay away from the line? How about instead of saying, hey, how far can I go this direction before it becomes sin? Why don't we just say, you know what, I'm not even going to go, I'm not even going that way. I'm going to go a different way. What if, we, what if we really decided that we were going to live our faith? What if we really decided, you know what, I'm going to live differently. I don't, I don't care what it costs me. Jesus gave his life for me, so I'm going to live in such a way that people can see him in me. Even if it means I don't get invited to every party. Even if it means I might not be a part of this this crowd or that group or whatever. Hey, you want to try not getting invited to party? Try, try being a preacher for a while. <laughs> Can I 
Try it. I mean, I'm okay with it. I'm not really a, that much of a party guy anyway. But try living in such a way. Because here's the thing. At some point, we're all going to stand before Jesus. And when you do, as a follower of Jesus, when you're standing before Him, there is going to be nothing that has happened up to that point that is going to be more important than the hope that you're going to hear from Him, well done. Good and faithful servant. At that point, there's not anything that's going to be more important than hearing those words. But you want to hear them? we got to live it now. we got to do it now. There's a whole world that's going, going to hell. No idea about Jesus. God sent us into the world with the good news of Jesus Christ, and we're supposed to live as though we believe that it is true. There are some of us that could say it, but we ain't showing it. We'll tell people that we believe it, but we're not living like we believe it. We need to start living like we believe it. We need to show first and then tell. Be a part of the world, but be a part from the world. It's a tough place to be. It's uncomfortable sometimes. It's difficult. It may feel awkward, but it's the right thing to do. It's the best thing to do. And just like Jesus said, anyone who wants to follow me, it begins with a relationship with Christ. There's three simple things you've got to do to begin a relationship with Christ. Number one, you've got to admit you're a sinner. We're all sinners here. I've already been through that. I've sinned. You've sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We have to ask forgiveness of our sins. The second thing is we've got to believe that Jesus is God's Son, that He died on the cross for my sins and for yours, and that He rose on the third day according to Scripture. And then the last part, and this comes down to a lot about what I've been talking about today, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That confessing Jesus as Lord, within that means that we've got to turn away from our way of living. That means repent of your sins. Repent just simply means to turn away from them. It doesn't mean to show all this remorse. I mean, it... There will be some of that. But that's not what repent means. Repent's not an emotion, it's an action. It's turning away from our sin and our way of living and turning to Christ. It's that simple. And if you'd like to do that, if you'd like to know your sins are forgiven, if you'd like to know that you have peace with God through your relationship with Christ, and if you'd like to know that you're going to be with Him for all of eternity, through relationship with Jesus. If you don't have that assurance and you don't know that, but you'd like to, I want to invite you to pray this prayer of salvation with me today. I'm going to ask that everyone would bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to pray it. You can repeat it after me. It'll be short and simple. You don't have to pray it out loud. God will hear you no matter what. But pray it with me right now. Dear God, thank you for loving me. And thank you for Jesus. God, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and life. Cleanse me. I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe he rose on the third day, according to Scripture. So today... I trust Jesus as my Savior and I confess Him as my Lord. Now, if you prayed that prayer today and you meant it, here's all I'm going to ask you to do. You don't have to stand up. You're not going to have to make a speech. I just want you to, with everybody else's eyes closed and heads bowed, if you prayed that prayer today and you meant it, 
I want you to look up at me right now and keep looking until I see you. Okay? All right? See you. Okay? All right? Now, I still don't want anybody else looking around, but if, if you looked up at me, I want you to keep looking. I want you to know something, that that prayer and faith, you know what, that, that, the last part of that verse that said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. What that means is your sins are forgiven. That your name was just written down in what's called the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven where God is. And that means that you now have entry into heaven when you pass from this earth. And that's a relationship that, that cannot be changed. It is permanent. God the Father has adopted you as a son or a daughter in Jesus. Now here's what I want to encourage you to do. The Bible talked about living in such a way that we're not ashamed of him. That we confess. He said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who's in heaven. There's two parts of that. I want to encourage you to tell someone. There's different ways of doing that. John, our youth pastor, will be standing here at the, the front, and he'll dismiss us with prayer at the very end. And if you'd like to talk to someone today, what we'd love to do is talk to you, answer any questions, and talk to you about the next steps in following Jesus. If you got time and you'd like to talk to somebody today, he'll set that up with you and have somebody talk with you today. If you don't have time and you'd rather do it some other time, there's a number on the screens and a QR code. You can open it up, type it in, or you can just text, I did it, to that number, and we'll get with you and set up a time either on the phone or in person. But like I said, answer any questions and talk to you about the next steps in following Jesus. We're not going to ask anything from you. It doesn't mean you're joining the church. You're welcome to do that at some point, but that's, that's not what this is. We're not going to put you on a mailing list, and we're not going to bug you. We simply want to help you take the next steps in following Jesus. And so I would encourage you to tell someone about your decision to trust and follow him. I want to pray for you, and I want to pray for all of us that God would help us to live in that place of tension of, of reaching out and loving those who don't know Christ while not being a part of the world. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your mercy, for your grace. Thank you for those that made a decision today to follow you. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them, that, um, Father, as their sins are now forgiven, that, God, you would send believers into their life to encourage them, that as they open up and read your Bible, that they would hear you as you speak to them and teach them. And Father, help them to find the right church where they can grow and hear the Word of God. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of their spiritual journey. Lord, help us, Father, to live for you, even when it's hard, even when it costs us something, even when we feel like it's a sacrifice, Father, to live that kind of life for you, for the world. Father, we pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This Saturday is a Fifth Saturday Outreach. On Fifth Saturdays, we do outreaches centered around the theme of five. This Saturday, July 30th, we will do a five-hour, one-dollar car wash. To pull this off, we will have three different shifts for you to sign up for. To sign up for one of the three shifts, visit one of the tables out in the main foyer or sign up at greenwood.church events. Our final Greenwood Family Fellowship of the summer will be Sunday, July 31st from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at Splash Kingdom Water Park. We have bought out the park for the night, so it will just be our Greenwood family there. Please remember, ladies, we ask that you wear a one-piece swimsuit or a cover-up, and men wear appropriate length shorts. Tickets are just $7, so go online to greenwood.church slash events and purchase yours today. Children two and under get in free. August 3rd will be our church-wide Welcome Back Wednesday. We will be having both a night of worship for adults and students 6th to 12th grade and a back-to-school bash for kids pre-K to 5th grade. 
The kids can be checked in at the cabin across the street beginning at 6.15 p.m. They will be eating pizza, playing games, and enjoying Funky Monkey snow cones. Kids younger than pre-K will be checked in at their normal location. Once you've dropped off your kids, come join us for our Greenwood Night of Worship, where we will gather for a powerful time of celebrating and worshiping God. We are so glad you were able to join us this week. You can give your tithes and offerings online at greenwood.church give or by dropping them in one of the black boxes marked offering located in the back of the worship center and in the foyers. Now, here's one of our pastors. Thank you if you would stand with me. We'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Father God, we do thank you for the opportunity to come into worship together as a family. And Father, we pray that as we leave here, God, that we would be the church that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.